Hi everyone, welcome to week seven. Today we're gonna to be brainstorming about what we think came first musically when we talk about musical instruments. We have our voice that can be used as an instrument. And we also have actual physical instruments that will be making musical sounds. We also wanna brainstorm about why we had these sounds. Was it for communication? Was it for entertainment? Um, and let's start by me asking my first question, what do you think was the first instrument? Now there's no correct answer to this because we're talking about the times and nearly in caveman times, hunter and gatherer times, when we don't have buildings or structures, we don't have electricity, we don't have running water, plumbing, we don't have heating and air conditioning, we are living out in nature and our sole reason is to survive, okay? It's just survival, it's basic survival. So how do instruments come from this time? What were they used for? And how did we get to our point today where we have all sorts of instruments for entertainment, okay? So question, what do you think was the first instrument? You, you cannot be wrong because I don't think we can go back and actually prove it. We have some thoughts about what we think could be the first instrument, but there's no real um, documentation that far back in history, okay? So I wanna take the camera a little closer and show you some of my collection. These are my personal instruments that um, sometimes I keep in the classroom and sometimes I take them back home. But uh, this, is, this is the hard part about distance teaching, um, being able to see these and, and hold them and actually physically touch them rather than just watching it through a screen. But it's the best that we can do, so we'll make the best of it. So on the table, let's see if I can get this in view. Scroll this down a little bit. Okay, so if you were to ask me what I thought the first instrument was, I'm probably going to say it's some sort of a drum instrument, and I'll show you my drums. It could, it could be your voice too, but if we talk about physical instrument, you know, something that we're holding it and manipulating, I would say it would be a drum, in my opinion, okay? Here are my drums. There we go, we can see a couple of them. Now, again, we're in the time of hunters and gatherers. Let me kind of sit here so I can see. We're in the time of hunters and gatherers, and in order to survive, the hunter went out and got the food, an animal, and they would eat the meat. Nothing would be wasted. They were in no form to waste anything from that animal. So they would use the meat for food. They could use bones for utensils and weapons. They could use the hair or fur from the animal for clothing or warmth. And they found out that skin was waterproof. So when they would, I know it's kind of gross, but when they would stretch out the skin to use for leather or um, for other things, they found out that it was waterproof. And to find something waterproof at that time was gold, okay, waterproof. Now, if they had the skin stretched out, let's imagine, I'm gonna use my creativity here, let's imagine that you've got this skin stretched out and it's drying and something falls from a tree and it falls down and hits it and it makes a sound. And the caveman is, is like, whoa, what was that? What was that sound? Maybe something else falls again and they start hearing the type of sound when it hits that drying out skin and, um, and, and it makes those different pitches. So right away, this could be used if they stretched it across a piece of wood, a hollowed out log, just like this. But now they have something that can be louder than their voice perhaps out in a field. And they could start communicating with this whenever they were hunting or gathering. Now, the one that I have here, let me come closer to the screen. I don't know how easy you'll be able to see. This one is authentic. Authentic means it is made, it is made from the same materials like the time of the hunters and gatherers, um, the way they did, which means this is animal skin. This was made by a friend of mine who lives in Ghana. I know he made it specifically, and it's from a boar. So this is boar skin. Let me zoom in a little bit. We can see the hair. Okay, that's hair. That's a little hair left on it. 
And when you look really close, you can kind of see and hear the scratchiness. When they shaved the hair off this part of the skin, um, it's not perfectly shaven. There's still a little stubble, a little bit of stubble left on it. And this particular drum is called a djemba. And a djemba is this shape where it's, it starts out, works its way in, and then skirts back out a little bit. It has that hourglass shape. This is also quite heavy, and it's carved out of a tree trunk. He made this by hand. This was made by hand. And this is an instrument that I love to pass around in the classroom, only if you want to hold it. I respect those who say that they didn't want to touch it or hold it because it was made out of um, a, a live animal at the time. So I respect that some people didn't want to hold it or play it. But it is quite heavy. It is made with boar skin carved out of a tree trunk. Don't stick your hand in there, you'll get a pretty terrible splinter. Okay, this is a djemba. Another instrument that he made is this one. Double head, there's a head on this side and a head on this side. It was also made out of boar skin. Um, the hair has been completely shaved off. But when you zoom in, you can really tell that that's, that's a skin. You can really tell that. Okay, these strings are, um, they're dried out guts, <laughs> actually. They're, that's how they made these, this string or this twine. Um, this is called a dune dune. A dune dune is also called a squeeze drum if we had to Americanize it. And I hold it in one hand, and as I pull and hug these strings, it's actually tightening and loosening the drum head. And when I'm tapping that while squeezing, it changes its pitch. So when you have a drum like this, you're now um, you're communicating that high to low or low to high, and a hunter or gatherer could come up with some sort of a system where if you knew what little melody was coming from it, you knew whether you were in danger, whether you were in safe, whether you needed to come back home. They would use this to communicate. Now, I do think that communication was the first use out of the drum instruments, but it also very quickly turned into entertainment. When you don't have anything to do, if you have something that you can get a beat going and it makes people kind of start to move, now you have some sort of entertainment. So lots of people started making drums of their own in order to communicate and have a little bit of fun. Today, we come back to change the screen a little bit. Okay, the one that's on the floor. Today, we have um, instruments that are replicas. They're made to look like the real thing, but they're made out of synthetic material, man-made material like plastic. This is um, a plastic drum head, and we have several of these in the classroom. This one's called a tubano. Okay, so we have a lot of these in the classroom that are man-made, they're plastic, so you wouldn't be worried about touching them if that, if that kind of creeped you out, all right? Now, let's talk about some of the other things I have on the table here. If I were to ask you what types of materials you're primarily seeing, you're seeing things made out of wood, okay? We don't have a lot of man-made materials yet, if any. So we have to work with what we have in nature. And if I were to ask you what kind of instrument came first past the drum, this is kind of where I would try to lead you if we were having a discussion in the classroom. So take a look at this. It's called a pan pipe. Little pieces of bamboo. How do you think this was discovered? Okay, so let me tell you how I think it was discovered. And again, I, I think I have a very good educated guess, but there's really no way to prove it. Knowing that these are made out of shoots of bamboo or reed, stems. Let's imagine, again, here we go with my story time creativity. Let's imagine that we're still in the time of the hunters and gatherers and you are walking around a lake or some sort of body of water 
and many times that the moisture in the ground produces reeds, big reed bushes, little bamboo trees, shoots of bamboo. And sometimes, just like a flower stem, those shoots of bamboo or reed can crack or break. Okay, maybe heavy wind, maybe an animal came through and knocked it and it broke down. So now you end up with an open tube, just one of these, not 20 of them mixed together, just one, okay? It's a windy day and the wind blows and all of a sudden you hear, I hope you could hear that on the video. And I was just blowing gently like a breeze and it kind of catches your attention. You're thinking, what was that? Didn't sound like an animal. I've never heard a sound like that. And so you listen a little or look around closer. They very quickly learned that the shoots of bamboo or the reeds, when lined up in different sizes, would produce different sounds. The longer pieces had lower sounds and the shorter pieces had higher sounds. And now, Again, you could use this to communicate. It's not gonna be very loud, but you could use this to communicate with someone and you could very quickly start learning how to play little tunes on it. I, it could be louder for me to play for you if I did rest it against my lip, but since this has been on display for 16 years in my classroom, um, it's collected a lot of dust and it's had lots of hands on it because we always pass it around. So I'm not comfortable putting it up to my lips and blowing into it. And this is not an instrument that I can sanitize because it's wood, and if I sprayed it with sanitizer, it would dry out the wood and crack it, which you'll see on another one of my instruments. I'll try to make a little sound again, but close to my mouth. So that's a pan pipe, okay? Now, when people started making this, this is when uh, competitive people started to, to emerge. Let's say Frank makes one of these. And Frank's walking around playing it, and his friends are like, Whoa, what is that? Where did you get that? I want one. And then they would go out and, and take some shoots of bamboo or reed pieces, and they would attach them, line them up, and they'd have their own instrument. And then the next guy would want to do it. Everybody would want to go out and make what you had, and they want their own version. That's like when something popular comes out, and your friend has something, and you want to go buy it too. Okay, that's, that's what was happening. Um, the ones that were made back then, there was no way for them to be all the exact same. There are no measurements that didn't exist yet. We were all just putting our own little pieces of what we could find in nature, putting it together and making our sounds with it. So how did this evolve into a recorder? I actually, I don't have my plastic recorder here at the classroom. It must be at home. You know, I don't know if in um, third or fourth grade if you got to play the recorder, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's a little tube, plastic, it's got the holes in it and you blow into it and you can make little songs out of it. So here is how our pan pipe turns into a recorder. This is just one piece of wood, whether it's bamboo, something that's sturdy, and somebody decided to put holes in it. In my opinion, I think one hole happened first, and then somebody said, I'm going to put two holes in mine, three holes, and then as many holes as I could fit on the instrument and cover it with my fingers, okay? And this one is a Chinese instrument, but it did crack. See that crack there at the top? So it is not playable. I, w I wouldn't be able to put it to my mouth right now, again, because we've had our hands all over it, and... Um, because it's wooden and I can't spray it to sanitize, it would crack it further. But this is an example of what would come next, and it kind of sounds like a recorder or flute. I have several examples, so I'll show you them. And again, none of them are the same because there are no, um, there's no blueprint for it. There was no measurements to make it. It was just, I saw that person had one and I wanted to go make one for myself. After about 100 or 200 years, we, come up with a system to say, make it this long, this wide, with this many holes. Once science started to evolve, we could put a little science to it. Look at this one, hand carved, hand painted. So now we're getting fancy. Okay, this person said, I'll make what you have, but I'm gonna one-up you. I'm going to carve um, these figures in it. 
very pretty. And you would blow in this end right here and then cover it with your fingers. This one's from Japan. It's a shakuhachi. It's kind of long. It was just whatever they had in nature. That's, that's the piece they found. The top that you blow into. Native American, also very long. A little bit of carving on this one. Okay. So those are my flute-like instruments. Now, how did we get from this to the flute that you have seen today? We had a lot of evolution happen um, going into the 14, 15, and 1600s. Lots of experimentation. Whatever this guy made, this guy wanted his own version, and this guy wanted his version, and so on. Now, once we get some ways of keeping record and science, length, width, spacing of the holes, now we can start making instruments that sound the same, whether you make it, you make it, or if Frank makes it, okay? And that's when we come across what I have in these boxes. There's a little story with this. I, my main instrument is flute, and I have always been looking for antique flutes. As a flute player, I wanted to know how did my instrument evolve. I was very interested in that. And in the 1600s, we started experimenting with metal. So now I have a piece of wood and metal. And we were able to shape metal. And if I press a button and it's connected, I can open a hole that's way down here. And my fingers aren't even there. See that opening? So now we're getting pretty smart with I can put holes somewhere else on an instrument even if my fingers can't reach it. I'll build a lever mechanism to open and close it. And the very first flute had only one key on it. Of course that makes sense. I'm gonna like oh look I'm gonna put a key. Guess what happens immediately? This guy says I'm going to make that too, but I'm going to put two keys on mine. Two keys. Here's one. Here's one. Next guy is going to put three keys, so now we have another key. Until uh, we have the flute that I'm holding in my hand right now, I can carefully put it together. It doesn't go together completely. Um, when I bought these, I did not know if they were replicas or real. Um, the instruments that are on the table, those are replicas. They were made to look like the old instrument, but they are not from the 11, 1200s. This instrument, however, is an 18th century flute, which means it was made in the 1700s, and it has been authenticated. This is what it looked like in Mozart's time. Okay, the 18th century is the 1700s. That is when Mozart is composing the music that we studied last, two weeks ago. And this started Beethoven's era. But then, in, at, by the end of Beethoven's era, we made a lot of developments and there are more keys and the flute actually looks more similar to what it does today, where it's made out of metal, has all those little shiny keys and buttons on it. Okay, but this is an 18th century flute. It's not completely put together here. It's cracked, so this one is not playable but it is real. And I had them authenticated years ago when I bought them and they're valued at about $15,000 even in the condition they're in, which is pretty amazing. All right, let's set this one aside and I'll show you the other flute that I have. Same time period, slightly different size. They did not, they did not mandate exactly how long this flute is shorter than the other one I just had out. It's not as big, but it has the same amount of keys, slightly in different places. So this was this person's version. And this one is playable. Let me talk about the top of this. What do you think this is made out of? This black part is wood. It's called grenadilla wood. This is ivory. What does ivory come from? Do you know? It comes from elephant tusks. And unfortunately, 
In this time period, people were realizing how much they could make out of elephant tusk, out of ivory, and um, jewelry was the number one. They were making ivory jewelry. I remember my grandma having these yellowish white earrings and necklace and bracelet, and she had always said how expensive they were um, and that they were priceless. And now I know why, it's because they were ivory. And today it's illegal. It very quickly became illegal because people were killing the elephant just for the tusk and nothing else. Very different from when they were making drums. They were not wasting any part of an animal. It was for survival. But um, in this case, when they were making jewelry and the flute tops and piano keys, piano keys were made out of ivory, um, it very quickly became illegal because they were killing the animal just for the tusk and to make money, and that was not okay. How many of you have a piano, an old, real piano, not a digital piano, a real piano that the keys are all yellowish? And if, if it's all yellowish like this, that's ivory. And that's actually worth a lot of money because they're ivory. And they don't make them like that anymore. I can play a couple notes on this. I really don't know what I'm playing because this is very different than my flute and the way that my flute operates, but I can kind of play a couple sounds on it. So Mozart could have played this flute, for real. This is authenticated. This one was, was valued at 17000 because it doesn't have a crack, and it's still playable. So this came from the 1700s. It has been authenticated. Um, it, it could have been Mozart or Beethoven, or a player in Mozart or Beethoven's orchestras. Okay, that's exciting. I think that's exciting. Let me put this away. And there's just one more thing I wanted to talk to you about. And again, it is an instrument. It was made in nature. Put that aside. This is a didgeridoo. <laughs> look at this. Giant piece of bamboo. Oh, look, you can see the wood. You can see the wood. I can see the windows behind me. A didgeridoo comes from Australia. And you're supposed to put it on your mouth, and I'm going to make a funny noise, but this is how you play it. It's kind of like a trombone buzz, but much looser. Um, let me go get something to put on top of this to protect my mouth from the instrument, because we keep touching it. It's wood, so I can't spray it. But Matthew, can you get me a tissue over there? Yeah. I have a helper in the classroom today. He'll bring me a tissue, and I'm just going to place it over here and then try to get it to make some sound. It takes all your air, and it's a really low, deep sound. Thank you. Okay. And I know this is one of our longer lessons, but um, it's super interesting. I hope, I hope you're enjoying it. I wish we could be together in the classroom doing this hands-on and having you hold them. All right, didgeridoo. I think I can get it lower. Hold on. <laughs> it's about the best I can do for today. It kind of takes all the wind out of you, too. All right, last instrument. Beware of this one if you're in the classroom. Watch out. Again, bamboo, pretty popular. This one is plugged on each end. It's been filled. I'm holding it still. This end has been filled, like solid, but there's something inside. This is called a rain stick, and it really does sound like rain. I'm going to play it, and I want you to tell me what you think is inside this making that noise. Oh, wait, they're all on this end. Hold on. Listen to that. It's still going. Still going. What do you think that was? Cactus needles. Don't drop this one in the classroom, because if this cracks open, we've got cactus needles everywhere, and that would not be good. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I know it's a little longer than our other ones, but 
Um, I just wanted to share these things with you. I wanted to um, make sure you're doing okay. And thank you for participating. I appreciate it very much. And I'll see you next week. Bye.